Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Mark Crilly. Mark has written and illustrated more than 35 books and graphic novels and is a 14-time Eisner nominee. His instructional YouTube videos have been viewed more than 380 million times. He lives in Michigan with his wife, Miki, and their children, Matthew and Mio. Mark, it it is a great uh, privilege and honor to have you on Cool Tools. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've really been looking forward to this. Yes, really, really great to to, to have you and your talent, and we are looking forward to the tools that you use. Well, hopefully they can be interesting enough. It's funny when I sat down to to sort of think of the different uh, tools that I could select, some of them started to sound decidedly middle-aged, and I thought, (laughs) (laughs) you can't do those. Come on. No problem. I I love it. And uh, (laughs) Mark, um, Kevin and I are both... uh, uh, d- dabbling uh, sketchers and we like to draw yeah. and sketch and things like that. And um, I don't know if Kevin's seen your videos, but I, as you know, I'm a huge fan of your videos and I post them a lot to Boing Boing and stuff. So it's going to be fun to uh, hear about some of the tools that you use. Why don't we start and tell us about your waterproof inking pen of choice? Uh, yeah, it's the uh, the Pigma Micron, uh, and um, I selected a, a particular thickness. That's how nerdy I'm going to get about this. <laughs> it's, it's the 08. Uh, and uh, first, I should say that it, the, the primary attraction of the pen for me is that it is uh, good um, waterproof ink, which for mm. years, in my early years of um, uh, drawing and sketching with ink, I made the mistake of using these water soluble pens and then just one little bit of saliva or rainy day or what have you, and you can ruin a perfectly good drawing. And so, and so, um, how did you get to the O eight? Um, and, and, and in the realm of whiffs, is that like really, really fine? Is that kind of medium? Is that bro- uh, bold? I don't know what O eight really even means. Well, thanks for asking. It is a little obscure. And the truth is, it's very much on the thick side. In fact, I would say it's thicker than most people would choose. People might be a little surprised that I'm drawing with um, such a thick tipped pen. But what I've found, uh, when you use a really fine point, you are locked into that one line width. Uh, Whereas if you use something a little thicker, um, like, you know, I think what they do with the Pigma Micron is you, you go to 03, 05, 08. And it seems like they sort of jump to those uh, higher widths as you go along in terms of options. Uh, when you go to those, uh, you get the tip is a little wider than when you press down, you get a good thick line. Then you let up just a little bit and it starts to get uh, surprisingly thin. And uh, for me, it's really great to be able to switch back and forth and indeed to to get a single line that gets thicker at one point and then tapers off. Uh, that's, you know, artists love that kind of thing. And this pen does a really great job of uh, allowing you to do that. So, Mark, I want to ask a question because the, the kind of the surprising inking pen that you often use that I really like and, and bought is not really a pen at all. It's that, that black Prismacolor pencil. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I was torn uh, between those two, actually. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, talk a little bit about that one. Yeah, I sort of settled on this idea of, um, you know, uh, drawing in pencil uh, is my first love. You know, that goes back to early childhood. And I think most kids start out with just a simple number two pencil. And uh, uh, I I really love the sort of um, softness of a pencil line. And, you know, when you switch to ink, you get this very hard, crisp uh, line and um, there's a trade-off between those two and um, I started to realize that you could use a, a black colored pencil uh, and Prismacolor makes a very good high quality black colored pencil that allows you to um, sort of go to the darkest possible blacks um, without uh, losing that sort of soft edge uh, that you can get and so indeed I, I, I've come up with a process of, of combining the simple number two writing pencil 
uh, to give me the kind of lighter lines, the lighter shading um, that graphite affords and, and gets you, you know, pretty much to a, a dark gray, let's say, the, when you really lay into it and push down hard. Uh, but then I can pull out, you know, I can, I can turn it up to 11. Uh, I can pull out the, <laughs> I can pull out the black prisma color and that really takes you to true, uh, black and the two of them play very nicely together. I find, and, uh, indeed, uh, I ended up uh, making a book that was called the two pencil method as if I had somehow come up with some <laughs> magical new way of combining these two pencils. The two pencil method all cool. right the other thing um i would i want to mention about the prisma color though for in my experience once you lay it down it is not like a pencil it's like a pen you're you're not going to be able to erase a prisma color black pencil line yeah that's a very good point it's it's much more permanent um and you might be able to lighten it up just a little bit mm -hmm. with fervent oh. erasing but <laughs> for me it is certainly i start with the writing pencil and we might as well mention the dixon ticonderoga mm. yeah you gotta uh, mention that brand one that I, there's, that's the pencil that i use very widely available mm -hmm. uh that is uh, endlessly erasable really uh, even after you've pushed down quite hard uh, on the lead. Um, but then that's the first part of the process. And then when I'm ready to commit, you know, when I know where that I really want things to go to black, that's when I pull out the um, Prismacolor and, and go for it. But you're right, it cannot be erased. In photography, in photography printing, they have a method called duotone. And it's basically a way of printing really good black and white photographs by printing more than one color black. So you have you have kind of your light black and then you have your dark black. So it's like instead of printing multiple colors, you print multiple blacks. And oh, that nice, is really yeah. the best way. That's really the best way to, to print uh, a black and white photograph. Uh, well, in that's an interesting thing. You know, thanks for bringing that up because I didn't realize there was there's kind of an overlap there uh, between pencil drawing and photography. Called duo, duotone printing. Duotone printing. Yeah. In fact, in some of the S Epson um, printers that are that you can also those who like to print fine photographs with. Um, in digital printing will actually have four different blacks. Wow. Um, and so um, you are, again, you, you get that dynamic range, expanded dynamic range that you can't get with just a single black. That's cool. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. That's four yeah. different shades of black. Boy, that's right. really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's <laughs> commitment. <laughs> um, so um, the pen and then um uh, in addition to the pen, you have another tool you want to tell us about. Well, I guess the next thing on my list was the library stand. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is really more of a, a piece of furniture. But uh, as I thought of uh, the different things that I could talk about, I thought that this one was, was kind of interesting and maybe something that not everyone has in their home. Um, for those of us who grew up with libraries, you probably will remember the days uh, when they had uh, a sort of a dictionary stand, you know, where you could go and they would have the really giant dictionary laid out in a way that it's at a slight angle, you know, and can be uh, opened and flipped through by uh, any of the library patrons. And I found by way of this catalog, this, uh, I think it's the, the Monticello catalog that is based out of uh, Jefferson's uh, uh, museum there, uh, at his home, that uh, they had this special library stand that uh, presumably Thomas Jefferson used in his home uh, that has the same kind of angled um, uh, rest at the top that you can put a book on with its pages open. And um, for years, I, I did the sort of uh, standard idea there of just putting a dictionary on there. Uh, this was back before, you know, all the handheld devices and the Internet <laughs> uh, sort of made thumbing through a dictionary seem a little archaic. Uh, and, uh, and I would have it there as a writer, you know, and every time I had to look up a word, I would run over and, uh, and flip through my open dictionary as if I were at the local library. But what I've started to use it for, and the, and the reason that I brought it up uh, today for this podcast, is that I've started to put art books 
uh, on that um, sort of rest that's at the top of this uh, bookshelf. I should say that it, it is, in fact, a bookshelf uh, with three different shelves on it where you can uh, store books. And, and it's only this top part that has an, sort of an adjustable angle to it. Uh, but it's perfect for, for pulling out these beautiful art books that uh, maybe, you know, collecting dust on the shelf, you open it up and you can really start to enjoy these books on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, um, what I'm using right now, I've got a book uh, by an impressionist painter named Peter Brown, who um, works out of uh, the beautiful city of Bath, England. And I supported his Kickstarter uh, a couple of years ago and got this beautiful book from him. And uh, so every day I can sort of flip through, you know, every, pretty much every page is, has one of these beautiful impressionist oil paintings that he created. And uh, it allows me to enjoy this book uh, for months if I choose, you know, sort of flipping from page to page and, and newly appreciating uh, this book that might otherwise be locked away from view. Yeah, it's sort of like the way of instead of having them hang on the wall, you can have them almost like it's almost vertical, like on a wall, but you can change them every day. So it's like having an ongoing art gallery that's constantly changing and you have the chance to actually study the images rather than just glance at them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of um, of having your environment change a little um, uh, every day or every month, like with a calendar. You know, a calendar allows you to kind of change uh, the decoration on your wall once every month. And uh, this sort of allows you to do the same thing more frequently. Uh, and I think we all have uh, books, uh, especially art books, uh, that uh, we really wish we would pull out and look at more often. And I think this piece of furniture allows you to, uh, to enjoy it on a day-to-day -day basis. It really starts to uh, enrich your life. Can you hold big books on it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The one I'm trying to think, uh, I've, I've got it right here behind me. It looks like it's at least um, a, a foot and a half from side to side, uh, the way they make it. And, oh, that's um, great. Yeah, it's, it's really good for, for getting those giant art books uh, out and cool. running them up. And for the makers among us, this is a really great um, project to do because you can make your own version of it pretty simply and you can have your own design. The, you know, the idea, again, of, of having kind of a chest high inclined plane that would hold a big book. Um, you could do lots of things with that. Um, and it's a, a pretty nifty project if you wanted to undertake it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad to. I'm glad that you like the idea. This was one of those ones that sounded pretty middle aged to me, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> but I thought, no, nah, there's maybe there's uh, some people out there would get out their uh, Djibouti, you know, books with the no, no, no. Miyazaki I, illustrations in them. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Tashin makes these really over. I mean, super oversized books, and they um, often come with their own library stand with them. So. Um, I was in a Google um, office of a head guy there. I won't say his name. Um, and he had a, a Hockney, a Tashin Hockney book with his own stand as the wow. centerpiece in his office. Um, so it was definitely not middle age. This was very cool. Um, oh, awesome. So I think, I think that the library, you know, the book stand is in it. And it's in, I mean, the book is, you know, it's two feet by three feet. It's just gigantic. Um, and it has its own stand, and the open book is just, it's just like a billboard, but that you can stand there and turn the pages. It's just wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that story. You've you've rescued me from feeling <laughs> now. I feel hip and cutting edge. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Libraries. Yeah, yeah. Dude, check it out. I want to have one in my yeah. library too. It belongs <laughs> in your library for sure, Kevin. So, so Mark, tell us about the the next item on your list. This is a cool piece of furniture too. Yeah, it's funny. I ended up with two different pieces of furniture uh, on the list, but this one certainly is unusual, and it is the uh, Japanese kotatsu. And um, some may be already familiar with this, but for those of you who aren't, it is a, well, it would be close to a coffee table in height uh, for Americans. It's quite low uh, to the floor. Uh, and it has a, a, a heating implement built into the underside of the table. Uh, and what Japanese people will do 
Uh, and I should say that it's a little complicated because there's a, the, the upper surface of the table itself is separate from the legs and the lower surface, that, that sort mm-hmm. of structure that, ha- that has the heating implement attached to it. So you can remove the upper surface and then you take a big, thick uh, sort of futon blanket uh, or uh, something like that, and you drape it all the way over that lower section of the table mm. so that it go- covers the entire uh, structure and flows all the way down onto the floor. Then you take that upper surface, which really is just a simple square tabletop, and you put it on top of the um, blanket-covered structure. And when you switch on that heating implement and in the winter, I should uh, say, is the ideal time, and you stick your feet underneath this table, oh, it is just so <laughs> nice uh, to come in out of the cold and you, you stick your legs and feet uh, underneath the table and sit there. And it's basically our primary uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner table. Uh, wow. And, uh, it, it requires being a little limber, I got to say, because you're, you're sitting on the floor. You need to be able to fold your legs into the kind of lotus position, I suppose, to sit right, up. Right, right. Like yeah, it's very Japanese. You're sitting on the floor. You have to be comfortable with that. However, there's a, a version of it that they use in the um, farms in northern Japan that I really like, which is that there's under the table is a recessed hole. Ah. So you're sitting like on a chair and all your legs are down in the hole under this yeah. little square table and you still have the blanket around it. But instead of having to, you know, cross leg, you're sitting like on a ledge where your feet are all down the hole. And that is really the yeah, way definitely. for me to do it. That sounds good. I need that. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. That's nice. Um, for those of you who can't just uh, plop yourself hole. down on the floor. <laughs> Uh, right, right. Well, now I have to admit, though, that we, we get these sort of chairs, um, floor chairs. Have you ever seen mm. these? That they, they yes. have no legs on them. They just sit mm-hmm. on the floor. And this we, is for uh, your back. It, yes. Oh, that's nice. Right. Support. We've, we've bought four of those, one for each member of the family. and uh, so That really helps. That, that, which, that that's the cool tool there, right? Right. That <laughs> could be part two of this uh, recommendation to find those chairs. I can't think of the, uh, the maker off the top of my head uh, if you wanted me to recommend specifically where I got these chairs from. But uh, certainly it's, it's great to have the two of them together. It's like a legless chair. Yeah, that yeah, sounds yeah. that sounds good. Yeah, so so you have one more item on your list, and uh, it's a departure from furniture. Tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you gave me the option to uh, to name a nonfiction book, which is ideal for me because the truth is I read almost exclusively nonfiction. Interesting. Uh, and I just love it's funny it, and it's ironic, right? Because I write a lot of fantasy, mm-hmm. and I've never pretty much written a nonfiction book myself. Uh, yeah, but when it comes to reading, I really come right down to earth and I love nonfiction biographies, uh, history, memoirs. Uh, and in this case, I've decided to recommend a uh, diary, uh, a series of diaries, actually, by the uh, member of Monty Python, Michael Palin. Uh, and I'm hoping that there are at least some Monty Python fans out uh, there that might uh, consider uh, checking this out, he began keeping a diary almost precisely at the moment that uh, Monty Python was born, cool. you know, the, the sort of six-member troop. And he was so good at uh, literally, you know, keeping this up every single day uh, so that you can read as uh, the events unfolded uh, how it all came to be. And, you know, I was, you know, I, I'm a Monty Python geek and, and have been since childhood and have, uh, you know, watched all the shows and seen all the movies and, you know, used to buy the records and all of that stuff. Uh, so it really was a delight to sit and read through this uh, diary that uh, Michael Palin kept and then years later decided to publish. Uh, and it is, it's, you know, it's like 600 pages long. Wow. So you have to be, <laughs> I would say, pretty into uh, Monty Python, uh, or at least maybe curious about Michael Palin, uh, 
uh, to to read the whole thing. But I found it engrossing, frankly. What was it about um, his diary or his life or his style that really attracts you? What what, what is the sort of the special attraction for you besides your interest in Monty Python? Well, he's a great writer uh, to begin with. He just has a real uh, knack for writing. And he his approach is very often to really put you there at the table. You know, so if he had lunch with uh, John Cleese and Eric Idle, uh, he would, he'll describe the food, he'll describe the drink, he'll describe the, the witty remark that John Cleese made, and then the even funnier thing that Eric Idle said in response. Uh, and yeah, you just feel like a fly on the wall the way uh, he writes it and captures it. And he's, you know, he's quite frank, you know, at certain points. He'll, he'll say when he's annoyed by something that uh, uh, John Cleese has done or uh, some way that he feels slighted maybe. Um, as a member of uh, the gang. Uh, but I'll tell you the truth. The real reason I decided to mention this is, is a personal reason, and that uh, that is that when I uh, reached the end of reading this diary, I was so inspired uh, that I began to keep a diary myself. Uh, and uh, this, was, this was 11 years ago, uh, the year 2008, uh, basically, uh, was when I started uh, keeping a diary. And, and to be honest, since I had never had up until that point, I was a little hesitant and thinking, I don't know, am I really going to be able to keep this up? It sounds like it could be a, a nuisance, you know. Uh, but the truth is, once I started uh, writing these uh, things down, and for me, I'll be honest, it's, it's not every day. Uh, very often, uh, it's at best once a week. Uh, and sometimes even less frequent than that. But uh, I have managed to really keep a pretty good account of my life uh, for the last 11 years. And for me, the main thing that I love about it is that we all have these little memories, like little uneventful things uh, that you just might forget, you know, if you don't make note of it. Uh, some funny little moment. And, you know, my daughter uh, at that time was uh, right around a year old. She had not quite yet reached the age of one, I believe, when I started keeping the diary. Uh, and I was just thinking, boy, if I don't make note of all these little things, I'm going to forget them, as I fear I had done with my uh, son, who's seven years older, and I wasn't keeping a diary at that time. Um so my approach really is to, of course, you know, I make note of the, of the sort of big eventful momentous occasions, but I'm always trying to think of these little things that happen during the day uh, or when you're on the road somewhere and you think, boy, I, I want to remember this. You know what I mean? I don't want this to be lost to the sands of time. And, and my theory, though I haven't really done this yet. My theory is that when I go back and, and reread these things, uh, those little moments will be unlocked and, and I will be transported a little bit back to that day uh, that I might have forgotten otherwise. So how often do you go back to look at the old stuff? Well, it's funny, you know, when I, when I have the, uh, the, the book itself, and it's become a series of books, I haven't counted now, but I, I would guess I have maybe eight of them now, um, I will go back and reread within the book that I'm currently filling up. But it's pretty rare for me to go back to those earlier uh, volumes. And in a way, I think I'm kind of deliberately uh, putting that off so that I can forget. You know what I mean? And be reminded <laughs> by myself. <laughs> Increasing the joy, the differential. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You don't want it to be too familiar. Uh, right. But I can think of, I can think of one offhand uh, thing as an example, just to make it a little more specific. Uh, when my daughter was around one year, one years old and I was at the mall, I remember sitting there uh, sort of playing with her, sort of chasing after her a little bit. And this uh, considerably older man sitting next to me at the mall looked at me and said, oh, that looks like a young man's game, you know? <laughs> uh, and of course, I, I, I was not a young man at that point. You know, I was probably 40 or something. Um, 
And uh, I, I replied to him, yeah, I wish I was a young man so that I could enjoy this game a little more. You know? And <laughs> it's just, you know, these little moments like that. That's the kind of thing that if I had not made that note of it in the diary, I think I probably would have forgotten that by now. Yeah, for sure. And and so uh, let me, uh, do, do you keep a paper diary or do you do it online so you can like search on it? Well, I, uh, I'm doing it the old fashioned way. And I have to say that that is, uh, inspired by Michael Palin, that it's, it's paper and ink. And, uh, okay. what I do, the one thing that it allows you to do is periodically you can, uh, stick something in there like a movie ticket, uh, or, um, Oh yeah. Sometimes I would go to speak I would do public speaking at a school and they would give you the sort of visitor badge sticker, you know, that you, you would put Mm -hmm. on your sweater or whatever. And I I made a habit of always peeling those off and putting them into the diary Mm -hmm. uh, so that I had not just my words, but I had these little uh, objects that that would take. That's cool. That's great. But you've got me thinking there's not being able to search. Ah, man, that's, that's a big disadvantage. (laughs) Oh, well, now you get the serendipity <laughs> of browsing through it. <laughs> um, so, so Mark, in the, the time we have left, I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about one of the books, one of the many instructional drawing books that you've done that are really fun. I, I love the Realism Challenge book that you do where you set down an object like a leaf or a, a crushed paper cup or something, and then you replicate it uh, with with a pencil drawing. I love that. You also have a book that came out a few years ago that I really liked. That's a, an actual graphic novel you did that teaches you how to draw at the same time called The Drawing Lesson. Tell us a little bit about it and um, your kind of method of teaching. Well, yeah, thanks for asking me about that. That um, uh, book was um, originally going to be called The Mentor. Uh, before we changed the title to The Drawing Lesson. And uh, the original title sort of maybe clues you into what my initial idea was. I was thinking, you know, young artists, not all of them get the chance to have a good mentor who shows them the ropes and teaches them how to draw uh, and, and critiques them, you know, points out to them things where they could improve. And I thought, uh, if I did a graphic novel story in which the protagonist was a young uh, kid who wants to learn how to draw uh, and meets uh, an older uh, artist that he can kind of uh, uh, push into being his mentor, which becomes part of the humor of the story. Uh, I can give the people who read this story the experience, the sort of vicarious experience of what it's like to have a mentor. Uh, And, um, and, take this idea of the instructional drawing book uh, and and marry it together with the idea of a graphic novel to create uh, something new. Uh, and I can't claim to have come up with that idea entirely on my own. In Japan, they have a lot of uh, books, uh, you may be familiar, uh, manga, that uh, are like cooking manga, you know. And as you read the manga, there's a story, but you're also getting a recipe and you're getting tips on cooking. Uh, and it's amazing the the a variety of such books that they have in Japan. So I suppose I, I kind of borrowed that and thought, let's see if I can do this, uh, combining uh, what might be otherwise a kind of a dry instructional volume uh, with a whole series of lessons uh, with a, a story and, you know, bringing it to life. And, and my thing was to make sure that it, it really was a story, that it had a beginning, a middle and an end, that you cared about these characters. And without giving it away, uh, I have been told that by uh, a number of people who've read it, that they were surprised at how emotional uh, the ending of the story is, given that you might have just expected it to be, uh, you know, a, a silly cartoony uh, story about a kid learning how to draw. Um, I did make sure that that the ending had some weight to it, and uh, I, I'm pleased that I was able to to bridge the gap between what really are two rather drastic, drastically different types of books. Yeah, well, I I think you succeeded in that, um, and uh, you know I just recommend that people not only check out um, this book but also uh, 
uh, just do a, an Amazon search on your name to see all the different books that you've done because there's there it's just a wide variety. One is just drawing chibi, which are uh, like little cute anime characters, the kind with the big heads and the small bodies. You have a whole book on how to draw chibi. And another great place for people to check out your work is to go to your YouTube channel. Like you said, it's like wildly popular. Three hundred. <laughs> what did you say? Three hundred and eighty million views. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, coming up on three hundred and ninety million. Just think about how much That's how insane. much time you have um, taken from the world. <laughs> <laughs> they can never get that time yeah. back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's really lucky. I stumbled into uh, YouTube. In its very early days, I believe the year was 2007, which I think by wow. YouTube standards wow. is just like right at the starting. Point. Ancient history. Yeah, yeah that's the pl- plasticine. Yeah. And uh, I managed uh, to to build up this audience and um, uh, connect with people all over the world, uh, sharing basically everything that I can think of that I know about drawing. And are you still making those YouTubers? I mean, tubes, are you still doing it on a regular basis? Yeah, yeah. I, I was um, committed to new video every Friday for, I would say, the first 11 years or so that I was doing it. Uh, and then lately, I've started to allow myself a break every once in a while. I would say I get at least two or three videos done per month, though. Wow. And you're just using uh, the, the camera on a tripod with no microphone. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, I just got a, a Canon wow. uh, digital video camera from the local Best Buy and I uh, put it on a tripod. I point it straight down at um, my drawing paper so that the people uh, viewing the video, they almost feel like they're looking at the wall. You know, you you have this uh, 90 degree angle on what I'm drawing. You don't have to feel like you're peering over my shoulder. Uh, and uh, uh-huh. it's funny, in the early days, people were so mystified. Like, how are you doing that? Are you hanging the camera with a piece of string? Or how are you managing to get that angle? But it's really, you just get the tripod legs widely spaced enough that you can move your arm between them and, and keep drawing. Well, Mark, this has been a, a real pleasure to talk to you and find out about the tools that you use and just uh, to hear you talk about uh, your drawing process and all that stuff. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, Kevin. It has been a delight start to finish. Hey, everybody. It's your co-host, Mark. And I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cool tools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lickscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Kolos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week.